And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your own air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so excited to welcome back to the show for the second year in the row, my friend and fellow author, Alice Henderson, incredible th thriller author and real life bear expert. We're going to get down into it. She is here to give us the scoop on a blizzard of polar bears out tomorrow. Tonight, the night before the book comes out, Alice, welcome back to Mystery and Thriller Ravens. Tell us about the bears. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm just delighted to be here. Yay. Tell us about a blizzard of polar bears, woman. <laughs> so a blizzard of polar bears takes place right after this first book, A Solitude of Wolverines, right where that left off. Woo. So my protagonist, Alex Carter, who's a wildlife biologist, and she's fresh off her Wolverine study in Montana. And she lands a gig studying polar bears in the Western Hudson Bay in the Canadian Arctic. There she's embedded with a small team and they fly over the vast ice of Hudson Bay in a helicopter. And Alex has to lean precariously out of the helicopter with a tranquilizer gun. And then they shoot the bears in the butt and then they can get up close and take samples like fur, for example, and estimate weight and size. And then from there, they can determine the health of the polar bears. So, so far the project's going pretty well, but then things start to go awry equipment goes missing, her helicopter pilot unexpectedly quits, and then someone breaks into her lab and steals all of the samples she's collected so far. But Alex is determined she really wants to see stronger protections for the polar bears, so she manages to find a new helicopter pilot, but then their helicopter crashes out on the ice, and they're stuck out there on this vast sheet of ice, and armed assailants are closing in. So Alex realizes at that point someone is willing to kill to end her study. Well, you hooked me good, Alice Henderson. I got to know more about the bears. I got to know more about what happens to Alex Carter, intrepid protector of bears, wolverines, and other endangered species. I've got to know more. But first, I just want to welcome everyone who's watching. Um, if you've been here before, you know the drill. And if you're new, oh my goodness, welcome. We're so happy to have you. Here's the drill. Every Monday for hashtag Mystery Monday, because you know Mondays can be murder. I give you my two featured hand-picked authors and you get to ask them anything. So ask Alice about a blizzard of polar bears. Ask her about her writing process. Ask her about working on the show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. What? Ask her about ensuring scientific accuracy for... Um, for films, ask her about bears, ask her about wolverines, ask her about her adventures in the tundra, ask her about Alex Carter. We got a lot of questions. Get them going in the comments and I will get them right over to her. Anissa, mystery and thriller, maven top community member there saying, hey, Sarah and Alice, Anissa, welcome back. So great to have you. Margaret Pinard saying, hey, I recognize that Celtic not uh, backdrop. She is digging the new hair color, Alice. I am digging that rainbow hair as well. Sherry saying, I was lucky enough to get an arc, and this one is great. Sherry, welcome to the conversation. Great to have you here. Anissa is saying, wow, and there is a lot to wow about, Anissa. Let me get, let me tell you about it. There is a lot to talk about. So uh, let's get it going. If you have any questions, oh, Melissa Watson saying, hi, Sarah and Alice, joining us live from Australia. Melissa, always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for uh, for being with us. Welcome, Steve. Welcome, John. Welcome, Jackson. Welcome, Sherry. So great to have you all. Wherever you're watching from, YouTube, Facebook, my channel is Murder by the Book. You're in the right place. Let's get into it. So, Alice, you are no stranger to the tundra or uh, adventures with polar bears um, and grizzly bears and uh, many other kinds of bears. So tell us about um, a, a moment that you have had with our, our large fairy friends that informed this book. Well, I had the pleasure of spending um, months just before the pandemic up in the Canadian Arctic. And I was in the area of, so my where my book is set is the Western Hudson Bay where that subpopulation of polar bears live. 
And I was in the Beaufort Sea where the Beaufort Sea uh, polar bears live. And the Canadian Arctic, Sarah, is just magical. I went up there during the summer, so the tundra was all green and beautiful, and there's so much wildlife, lots of grizzlies and snow geese and uh, red foxes that actually look black there. I mean, it was just so neat. And as the summer progressed, I got to see uh, the tundra turned to all the fall colors of beautiful golds and reds. And then when we left, it was blizzarding, complete whiteout conditions. Um, so it was really neat to see it in all of these different phases of the seasons. And the, the way I, we took up there was just so neat. You, you leave out of Dawson City, Yukon and drive 742 kilometers up a dirt road that's just full of potholes. And it's really neat though, because you can pull over anywhere along the dumpster and, and just camp there. So that was really neat. And you end up in the town of Inuvik, which is a little town. And from there, you drive an additional 138 miles, or sorry, kilometers again on a a pitted dirt road uh, to Tuktoyaktuk, and that's where the Arctic Ocean is. So there's like belugas and polar bears, and it's just it's just a magical place. And I was so inspired to use polar bears for my next book because of the dangerous plight they're in with climate change. And I was going to go up to Hudson Bay in October of 2020, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic. I wasn't able to get up there where that population of polar bears is. So a lot of research, a lot of talking to uh, Hudson Bay researchers and how they're tagging bears out on the Hudson Bay ice. And it was a really fascinating project to work on. Ooh, well, I can't wait to hear more because you guys, Alice has had some close encounters of the bear kind. <laughs> they, uh, She's gotten very, perhaps dangerously close to these large, fascinating creatures. And I want to hear all about that. We have so much to talk about. But as always, um, I want to make sure this is your time because this is not my time. This is your time. So any questions for Alice, get them going. Susan uh, would like to know, ooh, which is your favorite, the bears or the wolverines? So in Al in your first book, Alex Carter, book number one, you uh, you worked with wolverines. You yourself have studied wolverines. You've even seen a rare wolverine. Um, Alex was 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 working with the wolverines. Now she's with the polar bears. Susan wants to know which is your favorite. I want to know too. I couldn't possibly choose Susan. That <laughs> They're, they're so unique, they're so different from each other. And I love bears so much. Um, and wolverines are just such a neat, unique animal in their ecosystems. And I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you which one I like better. I'm just in love with both of them. <laughs> Tell us your favorite thing about wolverines and your favorite thing about polar bears because you've seen you've seen one wolverine, which is a once in a lifetime uh, sighting. How many polar bears have you seen? I, can you believe it? I haven't seen any. The um, when we were up by the Beaufort Sea, it was this. You know how the Arctic is heating like three times faster than the rest of the the world, <laughs> and I actually also, did not know that. Thank oh my you. gosh, it's it's so bad. And when I was there, the, the heat wave was so bad that animals like belugas weren't where they normally are. Polar bears weren't where they normally are. Um, the heat wave had pushed them out. For example, I was in uh, Katmai National Park, which is uh, you have to take a little float plane out to this national park in Alaska. It's the only way you can get out there. And normally the salmon run up this river um, and you've probably seen those iconic photographs of Alaskan brown bears just catching these fish as they jump up the waterfall right into their mouths. But it was so incredibly hot that the fish weren't spawning upstream. So all of the bears were just kind of hanging out. There's a lake there called Knack Knack Lake that the river feeds into. And the bears were, it was kind of fun. It was so hot that um, I was swimming a lot in Knack Knack Lake. And the bears would come and the salmon were kind of circling around in this lake. So the bears would come and swim out like right where I was. And of course, you're supposed to keep your distance there. So I would start swimming away and the bears would <laughs> come out and just fish right there in front of me. And it was an amazing experience. But unfortunately, um, being driven to like an area they normally wouldn't be in at that time of year because it was just so incredibly hot. Oh, and my favorite thing about wolverines. Um, yeah. I would say they're, it's just incredible how they can climb. I mean, you'll see these wolverine tracks like in the snow going right up to the side of a mountain and then they just go straight up and then straight back down the other side. I mean, they can climb like 
there was a wolverine in Glacier National Park that climbed almost 6,000 vertical feet of a mountain in 90 minutes. <laughs> They're just amazing. Wow. And a member of the witch family? Which family is it? Weasels. Oh, weasels. Yeah. I find that fascinating. Okay, cool. I'm learning so much. Uh, Jason, hi. Welcome to, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. He's saying, hi, Sarah and Alice. Thanks for putting on this event. Our pleasure. Thrilled to have you. He says, I am looking forward to a blizzard of polar bears. Very cool. Jason, welcome to the conversation. Wondering if you read Alice's first book, A Solitude of Wolverines, which, very exciting news, Barnes & Noble just picked two weeks ago as their thriller book of the month. What? Congratulations, Alice. Tell us about that. Thank you. Yes, so Barnes & Noble, the paperback for A Solitude of Wolverines came out, and they chose it as their mystery and thriller pick of the month, which was just fabulous. Um, it meant that in every Barnes & Noble store nationwide, A Solitude of Wolverines had its own little table and display. And I was just over the moon. I, I heard from so many readers and bookstagrammers that were taking these beautiful photos of the book and all these great settings. And I'm, I'm just so honored they picked the book. And they're not the only ones who picked the book. Tell us more. Amazon also picked uh, Solitude of Wolverines as one of their editor picks. So that was fabulous. That happened uh, right when the hardback came out. So it's just been such an honor to see the book getting this much attention. Oh, this is so fantastic, Alice, because you're not just spinning a, 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 a tale that keeps us on the edge of our seats up till 3 a.m. turning the pages. You're also helping uh, to educate us about, I learned so much about wolverines and so much about polar bears because you are in real life. You're not just researching the book. You're actually a wildlife expert. You're an endangered species expert. Um, and you survey for the presence of these animals in real life. So you can, you're, you're, you, everything that you share in your book is factually, carefully accurate, correct? Absolutely. I really strive to have accurate uh, facts in my fiction. There's nothing like reading a science thriller and you get to a part where you're like, oh, that's that's not accurate. <laughs> you're like, wait, Wolverines have four legs, not six. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Margaret would like to know, do you feel as an ecologist that the thriller is the best match for climate writing? Could you see a scientist pro tag in a romance or sci-fi, for example? Cool question, Margaret. That is a great question. And you know, when I wrote A Solitude of Wolverines, I, I feel so passionately about the plight of wildlife. And I thought, well, if I wrote a nonfiction book about wolverines, the only people that would probably read it are people already on board with their conservation. So I thought if, if I wrote a thriller, then maybe people would pick the book up for suspense or action and then learn about the wolverine on the side. And it was interesting hearing from readers because a lot of them didn't know wolverines were a real animal. They thought of Hugh Jackman and the X-Men or the mascot for University of Michigan. So it was really cool to see people reaching out and saying, hey, I didn't realize these were a real animal and that they're in such a dire uh, predicament. So to answer your question, I think every genre we want to write about this stuff would be fabulous. I mean, romance has such a dedicated readership. Um, if romance writers wanted to incorporate these themes into their fiction, I mean, that would be fabulous. You could reach so many people. And and in the back of my books, of these Alex Carter books, I have a little section about if you want to read more about the species and even if you want to volunteer and help them, either in the field or remotely. Um, and so if boy, we could do that in other genres, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. Margaret, I sound, I feel like Alice is casting the gauntlet. I think the question is, will you accept the challenge? Our fellow author, Margaret Pennard, what do you, <laughs> what do you, what do you think? Um, wondering, will we see, uh, will we see S SWF single Wolverine female? <laughs> A lone Wolverine seeks romance in the cold tundra of uh, the, of the, of, of Montana. I mean, I don't know. It's an idea. Let's get it going, Alice. What do you think? Totally. In fact, I know who the protagonist should be in this. Um, mm because there was a wolverine that wandered down from Idaho all the way down here to Lake Tahoe in search of a mate. And he lived here for 10 years. And unfortunately, California has 
killed off all of the wolverines many many decades ago so there's no wolverines left here but this one guy named buddy that's what wildlife researchers named him came down here and was photographed numerous times on remote cameras and he never found a mate so in <laughs> desperately seeking single wolverine female i think <laughs> the protagonist should be we know so now buddy the wolverine me needs a little Budita, a, a female buddy. Oh my gosh, that would be so cute. Um, oh, cool question from Sherry. What will there be a new animal in the next series? So, Alice, you've also studied fruit bats, pika, which are also called pika, depending on where you're from. You've studied a lot of different animals. So, what's going to be the next, the next animal in your next book? I have chosen, and it's almost done. Um, I'm about to turn it into my editor mountain caribou for the next book and a lot of people when they think of caribou they think of what are barren ground caribou which are this massive herds in alaska and the yukon that go across the tundra but mountain caribou are a thing all of their own they live in very steep mountainous areas and they go up these mountains in the winter where the snowpack is really deep and they rely on these lichen that grow in old growth trees and the lichen take decades and decades to grow so the high snowpack allows them to stand on the snowpack and able to reach this really high lichen up in the trees. But unfortunately, because of <clears throat> climate change reducing snowpack and there's the clear cutting of old growth, our mountain caribou populations have been devastated. We had one left in the lower 48. It lived in a corner of Washington State and Idaho. It was called the Southern Selkirk Mountain, Popula Mountain Caribou Population. And for years, conservationists were trying to get it listed as a distinct population segment and get extra protections for it under the Endangered Species Act. However, the herd just continued to dwindle because clear cutting kept happening. And Finally, Canada took our last two living caribou up to British Columbia in the hopes that maybe they could survive up there, which their populations aren't doing well either, unfortunately. And it was only after the last caribou was gone that <laughs> finally under the Endangered Species Act, they got that listing as a distinct population segment, but we don't have any left. So it's very discouraging. So my next book is focusing on mountain caribou and Alex Carter is tasked with there's a tract of land that a land trust owns, and they're, one of the remote cameras picked up what they think might be a mountain caribou that's wandered down from Canada into Washington State. So Alex is tasked with finding out if this is true and confirming it. But the forest is full of upheaval. There's a clear-cutting project on more on moratorium while a judge decides if it can proceed, and a murdered ranger is found strung up in the local town park. So Alex has got her hands full trying to confirm this sighting in the midst of this chaos. That is a lot going on. Now, have you studied mountain caribou, Alice, or did you have to, as part of your 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 wildlife expertise, or did you have to, to immerse yourself in the world of the caribou? I have studied the barren ground caribou. I'm actually helped with this really neat project where caribou are fitted with these collar cameras, and, and then they detach at the end of the season and researchers go out and retrieve the cameras. So we were looking at these 10 second clips of caribou, which was so neat. I mean, you, you see their chins and they're wandering along and you see what vegetation they're eating and you see them with their calves and herds of other caribou. And I mean, it was just such a neat project. So I used that with the Alex Carter. She like the, the idea of the collar camera to be able to track where these caribou were going. And I just fell in love with mountain caribou. Um, I have talked to a researcher um, at University of Montana who was running the, the Barren Ground Caribou Project about getting involved more with mountain caribou, which I feel very passionately about. And what do you love about these barren land and mountain caribou? Is it, you know, what do you, what do you, I, I mean, I, I think I understand the allure of a wolverine because it's so hard to find one. And I understand the allure of the polar bear because they're, you know, they're, they're so cute <laughs> and the little babies are so cute. You just want to cuddle them. Of course you can't. Um, but what do you love about the caribou? I mean, they're like, look like a giant deer or a moose. What do you love about them? I think I love, well, also that they're extremely rare. I mean, even when we still had our herd of caribou left in the lower 48, there was only 17 members at one point, And then it just kept dwindling and dwindling. And I've always wanted to see one in the wild. And actually, when I was in the Canadian Arctic, um, searched and searched for the heart, uh, the heart herd, which is another mountain caribou population. 
um, to no avail. I mean, they're extremely elusive. So that that intrigued me. And I think mainly just their plight that we had a chance to save them and completely dropped the ball. And there are steps that we can take now to make this right um, if we step forward. And the thing about caribous, polar bears, and wolverines is that if we could get some kind of climate change legislation enacted that was meaningful, this would just do wonders for so many species. You know, we talk about the Endangered Species Act, but I think at this point, what we really need is an Endangered Ecosystem Act, because so many of these species are going extinct in the same ecosystem, and they're sort of being treated as these piecemeal um, problems to solve, if you will. And if we could just get some climate change legislation going, we could take care of so many of these problems at once. So what is our best move to help those steps? Is it calling our representatives? What can we do, Alice? I would say, yeah, there's a number of things you can do. Definitely encourage your representatives to support climate change legislation. Whether you live in a blue state uh, like I do and your representatives are already voting that way, let them know, thank them, let them know how important it is. And if you live in a state that doesn't support it, that's all the more important to reach out to your representatives. And in fact, calling them on the phone, which might seem awkward, is the most effective way to do it. And normally you're just leaving a message with someone just saying, I just want so-and-so representative to know that I want them to vote this way. And it takes, you know, two minutes and you're done. And the other thing people can do that's huge is um, in their own personal life, there's a lot we can do. Um, eating less meat, for example, is huge. Uh, think of having like a meatless Saturday with your family. And, and then another great thing is engaging in citizen science. Um, a lot of projects are looking for volunteers to help, including, you know, for the mountain caribou, the wolverine, the polar bear. You can either get your hands dirty and go out in the field. For example, with polar bears, there's a really cool project called the Whisker Print Project. And every polar bear, polar bears actually have black skin and transparent fur. And when their whiskers grow out, you can see the black dots where the whiskers are. And each polar bear, this is unique, like a fingerprint. So if you have a telephoto lens and you take a profile shot of a polar bear's muzzle, you're able to determine what individual that is. And it's a great non-invasive way for researchers to keep track of movement of different polar bear populations. And if, if you don't want to get your hands dirty out in the field, there's a lot of things you can do from your computer. Um, you can do projects in Africa where you're looking at remote camera footage and labeling what species you're seeing, for example. Uh, there's a great website called SciStarter.org, S-C-I, Starter.org. And they have tons of citizen science projects listed on there that you can engage in. And I think that also will help people feel less hope, hopeless because they're taking action, meaningful action toward this. And I can't stress enough, um, speak out and talk to your friends and protest in the streets. Um, we really need this climate legislation going. I am putting SciStarter.org in the comments. We can check that out because I think you're right. It's it's empower It's easy to get overwhelmed and hopeless and feel depressed and just be like, oh my God, it's all too much. It's all too much. I'm feeling that way myself right now, <laughs> panicked slash depressed. But there are steps that we can do and that's empowering. Action is empowering. Um, welcome, Antonio. Welcome, Ayo. Welcome, Patricia. Welcome, Karen. Welcome, Betty. Welcome, Susan. Welcome, Joe. Welcome, Shelly. Welcome, Stephanie. Welcome, Christopher. Welcome, Charlotte. Eric, Cynthia, Pamela, Paola. Welcome, Gary. Um, so great to have you all. Thank you for watching with us. Let us know if you have any questions. This is an incredible opportunity to talk to this incredibly knowledgeable woman about these rare endangered species, about what we could do about anything you'd like to ask her. Jason saying, I read A Solitude of Wolverines. It was my favorite read of the year last year. Jason, thank you so much. Amazing to have thank you with you. us. Thanks, um, Jason. Hey, <clears throat> Melissa saying, this is so fascinating. It's morning here in Australia and I'm bummed I have to go. We'll catch up later. Perfect. No pressure. Everybody, the replays will be up on Murder by the Book, Facebook and YouTube and my Facebook and YouTube. So you can always check them out um, when it works for you. We're all about on-demand viewing these days, right? Leslie saying hello from Canada, giving us her famous Canadian hello. Yeah. Leslie, <laughs> always great to have you. She commented earlier in the Facebook group that she was really looking forward forward to tonight. Um, so great to have you with us as always, Leslie. Margaret saying, yes, cross the board. Let's make every genre include climate apocalypse themes. 
Margaret will look forward to seeing single Wolverine female coming with coming from you writing that buddy the well, <laughs> buddy the Wolverine seeks his mate. <laughs> She's <laughs> laughing at me. Uh, Margaret, I'm serious. I'd read that book. Me too. I'm serious. She's <laughs> but a romance. Exactly. Um, we can also check out, oh, this is so great, Margaret. Thank you. Conservationw.org. Oh, they're Harvard. great. Absolutely. Yeah. And they have not only the Mountain Caribou Project, but a Wolverine Project where you can go out in the winter and look for Wolverine tracks. So Ooh, I would do that. I have a mighty huntress, a 14 pound Pelu. She's a good tracker though. <laughs> I like to know the Oh, Jason, I love this question. The animal groups are very, uh, names are very interesting. Did you come up with a blizzard of polar bears? So for those who don't know, is that what you, and, and I'm one of them, is that what you call a pack of polar bears, a herd of polar bears? Is it a blizzard? It's it's kind of funny, Sarah. When I first had the idea for the series, I knew I wanted every title to be the group name and the animal name. And so when I picked Wolverines for the first book, I thought, oh, great, you know, what's the group name? And there is no group name, as I found out, because they're so solitary. So that's why I chose, I had to make up a group name for them and chose a solitude of Wolverines. So then with Blizzard, uh, I found myself in the same boat again. There, there are group names for bears in general, but not for a specifically for polar bears. And some people have been making up some uh, recently. I've heard a celebration of polar bears, which I like. Um, and so my editor and I tossed around some different names and uh, we had we thought a frostbite of polar bears, perhaps a blizzard, a whiteout. Uh, and she ended up really liking blizzard. So we went with that. But once again, I, I was faced with having to make up my own group name. And uh, that is also true of the mountain caribou. There. You can say a herd of deer, but there's no group name for a subset of caribou. So I've created a group name for them as well. <laughs> Ooh, are you are you ready to share it tonight, Alice Henderson? For sure. So caribou, mountain caribou are often referred to as the gray ghost of the forest because they're so elusive. So I named my book A Ghost of Caribou. Oh my God, I love it. I hey, love okay, it. it's good to hear. So Alex Carter book three will be a ghost of caribou. Alice, and Jason, you're so, you're, you're, I think you're bringing this up so perfectly. Alice Henderson has the coolest book titles ever, right? A Solitude of Wolverines, A Blizzard of Polar Bears, and now A Ghost of Caribou. I love it. And uh, Alice, you'll be back to tell us about A Ghost of Caribou next year, I trust. Oh, please, Sarah. I would love to come back. Yay. Oh, uh, Margaret is already working on her romance of the <laughs> her romance book. She says she's got it. Lone Mountain Caribou wandering south as a travel blogger who coaxes his family down with wild reports of fame and fortune and ends up faking a date to impress his mother. Oh. Margaret, it sounds like you've given this some thought. <laughs> you have nailed it, Margaret. I cannot wait to read this book. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Love it. Um, she would like to know in all seriousness, what do your wildlife colleagues respond to? How sorry, how do your wildlife colleagues respond to your writing thrillers? How do science and art co-mingle as herds? See what you did there, Margaret. I like it. Herds. Tell us, Alice. It's very strange and sort of near the tween shall meet. Um, when I'm at like a wildlife society conference and I tell someone, oh, I also write thrillers on this side they're like what <laughs> and uh and then when i'm talking to my author friends if i'm say at a writer's conference and i'm like oh yeah i was just out tracking wolverines <laughs> in montana they're like what, what? <laughs> so it's it's sort of a strange disconnect between the two actually which i've experienced my whole life uh, my degrees are split down the middle between science and the arts so if there's a tendency, I think, in our society to sort of pinhole people like, oh, you're, or pigeonhole rather, oh, you're into science and therefore you're not an artist and vice versa. So it's been interesting to mix the two. Hmm. And you know what's interesting? I heard someone refer to it as a slash career. You know, so oh. we do expect people to have, you know, because I think in, in the U.S. we're so focused on career, the career becomes identity as though who you are who you are is defined by what you do as though what you do is the entirety or a very large part of what you are. That's the first thing we ask people, what's your name and what do you do? Right. Um, but oftentimes one thing is not enough. We're multidimensional, multifaceted people. So the, I'm seeing a trend now where it's a, you know, thriller author slash wildlife expert. Um, you know, Wolverine romance 
writer slash English so slash Scottish Scottish um, historical fiction in the case of Margaret Pennard, right? Anyone else feeling pigeonholed? Let us know in the comments. Um, so Alice, tell us about um, uh, what do you tell us? Tell us your favorite scene in the book to write and your favorite scene to have to read. I love action no, scenes. No spoilers. <laughs> right, no spoilers. Oh boy, uh, my favorite scene in the book takes place later in the book. So I, I will just say that I love writing action scenes and I love writing fight scenes. Um, when I have one of those coming up, if I get up in the morning and I see, okay, what's on tap for today? What scene should I do? I have to write, and if it's an action scene, I'm so excited. <laughs> and um, so hopefully, readers will find a lot of action and suspense in this book. And yes, my favorite scene is in later in the book it's an action sequence <laughs> what do you love about writing them wow i think i love the cathartic feeling of writing mm. and i like how the scenes when i write them seem to have a momentum of their own the characters i'll often know okay i i know i want the characters to get from a to b and i'll decide like well how injured can they get at this point in the book for example like and what are their resources available to them? What tools do they have? What weapons do they have? And so I'll have a general idea like that. Well, okay, she's got, she could use this as a weapon. She's got, this as her opponent. And I'll know generally how I want the scene to end, but then I won't know how it's going to get there. So I just sit down and write and it's like, I'm just chronicling what's happening. The fight or action scene just happens and I'm writing it down as fast as I can and often hours go by and then I realize, oh my goodness, the scene's done and I it didn't even feel the passage of time. So it's so cathartic, I love it. Ooh, a violence. Hi, <laughs> Alice Henderson, good to know. Alice, one time you were walking and a, you came nose to nose with a bear. Walk us through that scene in life. I mean, a real life scene of you and the bear. That was such an amazing experience. So I was in Glacier National Park and I was by myself and I was hiking along this lake and the trail was really eroded. So there was a lot of rock sticking out and tree roots. So I was picking my way slowly and I had my head down and suddenly I smelled the smell of rotten meat. And I looked to my left and there was a grizzly there was all these berry bushes <clears throat> along the beach of this lake and the bear was just stripping the berries off right into its mouth. And it was standing up on its hind legs doing this. And so I stopped and it stopped and it looked at me and this was right off the trail. It took two steps onto the trail, still on its hind legs. And it was right in front of me. And I remember my eye level was with its claws hanging down. <laughs> and I, saw that the stench of rotten meat smell was coming from it had like meat in its fur, like from eating a carcass. And I looked to the side and I turned, you know, I averted my eyes so it wouldn't think I was being aggressive. And it sniffed me from like head to knee, like, and, um, and then it just went on its way. <laughs> and the whole time I was thrilled. I wasn't afraid at all. I didn't sense any kind of aggression from the bear. Um, it was just pure curiosity on the bear's part. And it was just such a neat experience. And I remember turning around and this couple had come up the trail and I was like, there is a grizzly bear here. And they just did a 180 and like left immediately. And I was still like, yeah, that was so neat. So did you hear it, you know, sniffing you and did you feel the air getting sucked off your face? I did. I could feel the snort coming out of its nose and and just trying to, I remember just thinking, I'm just, my whole thought was, oh, don't worry. I'm not a threat to you, you know, <laughs> being a human and, and we're so dangerous as a species. I just was, my number one concern was that the bear wouldn't feel threatened by me. <laughs> Oh my God. Margaret is saying that would be me exiting stage left. Just <laughs> Margaret, you and I, girl, <laughs> are running the other way. No, we don't run with a bear. Or wait, you run away from some bears, but not others. What's the rule? So you should never run from a bear. Um, never if, run from a bear. Okay. okay. <laughs> if it's a black bear, oh, which we have a lot here, um, you can clap your hands and say, you know, move along and and they're so scared of humans they just immediately leave with a grizzly you, you don't want to be loud and you just want to look as inoffensive as possible and you certainly don't want to run that can like trigger their predator response so usually just stand there and um you know if you're stand to the side so you don't look as big and 
and they'll usually just walk away. And even if they do slap you down, <clears throat> they're basically just trying to determine that you're not a threat. So if you do ever get slapped down by a grizzly, um, just lie there. And it'll be like, okay, you're down. You're not a threat. I'm moving along. <laughs> but they won't be like, you're down now, you're dinner? No, predaceous attacks are exceedingly rare with both grizzlies and black bears. Uh, they're like 98% vegetarians. And when but they how do, do you know which one is which one to clap at? So you clap at the black bear, they'll run away, and you make yourself small and unassuming with a grizzly. But which one, how do you know? I mean, I wouldn't know which bear it was, would I? It's um so usually unfortunately now because no. we've hunted grizzlies to extirpation in so many states um you can determine if it's like there's no grizzlies left in california so if you see a bear here it's going to be a black bear and that's true for most of the country um except for like the pacific like way up in the rockies and that kind of area in alaska and the way you tell if there are both species the grizzly has a very wide dish face and it has a huge back hump whereas the black bear does not have that shoulder hump and it has a narrower face. And also grizzlies, of course, are much bigger. <laughs> but if you don't have the two side by side to compare, it could be tough. How big was the one that sniffed you down? Oh my gosh. Um, I got to say it, since I didn't look up at his face and his yeah. claws were eye level with me, I mean, it must have been seven feet tall, maybe. And I'm well over a thousand pounds. Oh um, it was a big, it was a big dude. <laughs> that was a big, big dude. Margaret summing up for us nicely saying for a grizzlies, be a wallflower. <laughs> That's no Absolutely. problem. Wallflower is my main mode. <laughs> be a wallflower. Um, Susan saying, holy cow, or should that be holy bear? Right, Susan? <laughs> Margaret from Nara saying, did you feel the air sucked <laughs> off your face? I mean, right? You can picture a thousand pound animal. You would feel that air getting brushed off you because they went, you know, I mean, you would feel that, right? That's a large, large animal. I've never been around a bear, but I've been around horses and they're about a thousand pounds and you feel their breath. I mean, it's a force of nature, literally. Um, very, very fascinating. Now, Alice, that's not your only uh, close encounter with a bear. You have found a bear in your car, casually sitting in your seat. <laughs> Tell us the story of the bear in your car. So, um, my best friend and I had gone grocery shopping and up here, you pretty much lock your car for bears, not like, cause people are not for people. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Um, so we'd gone grocery shopping and we were carrying the, the groceries up and I guess didn't lock the car <laughs> on the way up and it came back down and there was a bear sitting in the front seat, like in the driver's seat, eating a sandwich. <laughs> and what made it even more hilarious was there was a coyote sitting next to outside the car next to the driver's side just waiting if the bear dropped anything and um we were like hey and the bear of course immediately took off but uh just just honking the sandwiches down like fresh sammy so <laughs> how big was that bear that was a, a black bear i would say maybe about 500 pounds um <laughs> <laughs> had a really uh cool experience um i was sitting on the the couch in my living room and I heard this commotion outside on my deck and I opened the front door and there was a bear just sit, standing there looking at me and you know as I said normally you clap your hands and the bears just immediately just freak out and want to get away from humans so I clapped my hands and she didn't move she just continued to stare and I thought that's that's weird I had a, a weird feeling so I shut the the porch light off it was at night and I looked out of the window and I saw there were two other bears so I have an upper deck and a lower deck and these two other huge male adult bears were on the lower deck and they started coming up the stairs to the upper deck and she met them in the middle of the stairs and they had this knock down drag out fight i mean i could hear her like Roar! and she's slashing at them they like took out part of the railing and stuff and she beat the crap out of these two other bears and they ran off and then she just came up to the upper deck and laid down. And about 30 minutes later, these two little basketball sized cubs came crawling down out of a tree and like climbed up on her back. And so she was protecting her cubs from these two male bears who are known to kill uh, baby bears. So that was like the most intense bear encounter I've had up here. Um, so 
Wow. Oh my God. This is crazy. This is crazy. I can't, I'm a city girl, Alice. <laughs> the most I see is a squirrel. Um, in the green room, I was bragging about a squirrel encounter I had, and now I feel really stupid about that. <laughs> I was like, let me tell you, I had a close encounter with a squirrel. Alice is like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to anyway. hear about your squirrel's close <laughs> encounter. <laughs> anyway, a bear almost ate me. Alice in the middle of a bear fight. Bad <laughs> ass. I think Alice Henderson may be the most badass person I've ever met. This is amazing. <laughs> Sharon, great to see you. Welcome to the conversation. Top community member there saying, wow, this is kind of scary. <laughs> Margaret's, Margaret's picturing the bear in your car saying, what's up? What's up? What's, yeah, the bear didn't care. The bear was sitting in your car eating your sandwich, completely un, uh, unbothered by this. Oh my God, Alice, you are literally the coolest person I know. <laughs> Susan saying a grizzly has a hump. That's how we can tell them apart. Cool tip. Thank you, Susan. Margaret saying she's more used to getting the air blown onto her face by horses. Yeah, exactly. You feel that nice little poof of air. It's, their horses smell good. They smell like hay. It's very comforting. It's very lovely. Making Not sure like I didn't <laughs> Not like dead meat. Exactly. Not like <laughs> rot rotting meat. Oh my goodness. Um, well, this is such a fascinating conversation. We have just three minutes left. So any last questions for Alice about bears, polars, grizzlies, black caribou, um, Pika, Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Tell us about that. So Alice, you have not only worked on the show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you also have worked with Lucas Films, uh, aka George Lucas, Star Wars. Hello, cool person on the camera right now, um, to ensure scientific accuracy on film. So is that like, hey, Alice, would, um, would a bear get in a car? And you'd say, actually, a bear would get in a car. <laughs> um, what, what, what's that like? And eat your sandwich. And um, eat your sandwich. <laughs> bear will eat your sandwich. So um, yes, the so the scientific accuracy thing was so neat. It was actually a NASA funded writers workshop and they pick 12 writers a year and they fly you out to the University of Wyoming and put you up. And during the day, you listen to talks from astrophysicists and learn all kinds of cool things like what really happens when you're blasted out of an airlock or how to calculate escape velocity or slingshot maneuvers. I mean, it was so neat. And at night, then we observed through these huge telescopes, or if it was cloudy, we'd watch bad science fiction films and learn, you know, what they, how they did the science wrong. And it was just an amazing experience. And since then, I've, I've really, I mean, I always believed in using accurate science, but um, I really strive to have accurate science. And so... Very cool. I love that. I, I, again, I, I'm just going to keep saying it. I think Alice Henderson is the coolest person I know. Um, first clue has has um, says Henderson manages to marry both suspense and mystery in this book, featuring a classic suspense driven fight and flight with several overarching mysteries. It's even better than her excellent first book in the series, A Solitude of Wolverines. Congra congratulations on that rave review um, for, for a blizzard of polar bears and Thank the praise you. just keeps, just keeps, um, coming in. Mar uh, Sharon saying bears are fascinating from a distance. <laughs> exactly. Sharon. I don't want to ever feel the air getting sucked off my face by a <laughs> thousand pound, seven foot tall bear. Oh my God. Um, Margaret saying go murder by the book. Great author interview, Sarah and Alice. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much for tuning in. Always a pleasure to have you. All right, everybody. I want to remind you that this book is out tomorrow. We are getting the inside scoop right here, right now, before this book is even out. So this is your chance to ask this incredible woman um, anything you want about this book. This is a sneak peek into it. Um, we are honored to have you. Thank you so much. And I'm popping the link to the book in the comments um, so that you can grab your copy. It's pre-ordered tonight. It will ship out to you tomorrow when the book drops. So grab your copy tonight. Anissa saying, awesome chat. Thank you, ladies. Anissa, always a joy to have you. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to remind you all that I run a free Facebook group, free and open to all. I do a ton of book giveaways. You can request authors. You can submit questions in advance. So we continue the conversation over there, it is Mystery and Thriller Mavens, and I'm popping the link into that, so you'll want to be able to join. Follow Alice on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. She's everywhere when she's not out in the tundra, you know, checking the bears <laughs> um, or the caribou. So um, welcome, Laura. Great to have you. Mindy, Linda, Jerry, Mary, 
uh, making sure I didn't miss anybody. Thank you so much for being here. Gab Gabrielle, Jacqueline, so great to see you. Pam and Evelyn, thanks for joining. Um, Y'all, this has been a fabulous, fascinating conversation. Alice, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We will see you next year for a ghost of caribou. Congratulations on a blizzard of polar bears. And y'all, grab your copy tonight. Link in the comments. Alice, thank you so much. Jason, thank you. He said, thanks for putting this together. Sharon, thank you. Thank you all. I'll be back at 8 o'clock with Nicholas Meyer here with his brand new Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson book, The Return of the Pharaoh. See you soon. Thank you, Sarah. This was such a pleasure. Thank you, Alice. See you next year. All right. I look forward to it. Thanks, everyone.